Kylie Cheer here, host of the Witch Money Podcast. Join us each week as we bring you the best experts and top advice to help you make the most of your money. From property prices to budgeting, investment platforms to pensions, we'll be here to keep you informed. Here's a taste of what you can expect. If you had invested £100 in the fund three years ago, you'd have just £61 today. Gosh. Is it worth trusting a website that you don't know to save that 10p, that 20p. The good news is it does look like we're hovering around the top of the interest rate hike cycle. If I asked you what you earned here, you'd be absolutely horrified because we're told we should not talk about money. Make sure to join us for new episodes every Friday and I'll see you then. Hello and welcome. I'm Harry Kind. And I'm Grace Farrell. And this is Get Answers, for living your best consumer life. When life gives you questions, which Get Answers. On today's show, we'll be talking food waste. How can you save money, reduce your contribution to climate change and spend less time shopping, all while eating better grub? We'll be joined by the founder of The Full Freezer, Kate Hall, to learn how to eliminate food waste at home. And then later, we'll be talking to Witch's own Shafali Loth, who's going to reveal the most and least sustainable restaurant chains, according to her recent investigation. Now, Grace, before we start, let me give you the lay of the land when it comes to food waste right now. According to RAP, which is the big campaign on food waste, the UK wastes around 11 million tonnes of food. And while some of that happens on the farm or in the factory, sadly, 60% of it is actually getting all the way into our houses, into our fridges before we then chuck it away. And actually, we buy 42 million tonnes of food and food waste is about a quarter of that. Now, to me, Not all bad news. It's good news. We've got the power to make a difference. But I want to get a sense check from you, Grace, because those are some big numbers. Do you have a handle on how much you throw? Do you think it's around about that quarter of the kind of total food that's created? I mean, those numbers, they're just so big, aren't they? It's actually hard to fathom what it actually means. I mean, I would say with my food waste, I try not to waste food, but I do. And I know for me, the biggest culprits are hummus. I just Mm -hmm. can't seem to get through an entire tub of hummus, but I want it. I want to have hummus in my fridge. Also, I I buy things that are reduced in the reduced section of the supermarket with good intentions and then don't get around to eating them. They go into the bin. And lemons and limes are another thing because you kind of, you buy a pack of them yeah. and they use one or two and then they just go kind of mouldy in my fridge so uh, yeah i don't know if i throw away a quarter of my food but certainly a bit i, I want to be that like dakota johnson of having the big bowl of limes and just saying i love limes and having them there all the time but they just go unless you really get into gin and tonics yeah. i find and, and also like it's almost an argument for I, I, I find myself wishing for some shrinkflation on hummus i wish i could have a smaller <laughs> pot of hummus that i would eat in maybe a sitting a sitting's worth of hummus but I am going to say that we've probably got a solution to some of this because today we're joined by the wonderful Kate Hall, who is the founder of The Full Freezer, the author of The Full Freezer Method, which is coming out next week. Very good timing. But most importantly, like me, she is a freezer nerd. Welcome to the show, Kate. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Kate. Let's get into it. Freezers, give us the pitch. Can they help us reduce food waste? Oh, like you would not believe. So, you know, talking about your hummus and your lemons and your limes, you can freeze them. You can use them from frozen. You can defrost them quickly. We won't dive into that too much because I will just spend the whole time just speaking about that. But yes, most of us think that our freezers can be used for shop-bought frozen food. It can be used for batch cooking. Actually, it is a magic pause button in our kitchen. It is an appliance that is always running, it's always on, and so many people are underutilising it because they don't realise that they can freeze those individual ingredients that would usually end up in the bin. So starting to use our freezer as that pause button instead of letting that food go in the bin can save us so much food, but also so much money. Well, let's jump into lemons then, since we mentioned lemons. (laughs) What would you do? You've bought five lemons, you've used two. Yeah. The three are starting to look a little bit dodgy. You've got choices. Yeah. So you could freeze the whole lemon or lime, but you are then going to have to use the whole lemon or lime when you defrost it and it's going to take longer to defrost or you're going to have to microwave it and you have that risk that if you don't do it on very, very low, it will explode. 
road. <laughs> so please don't do that. Um, that would sting so, as well. It is. Yeah. But the things that I would recommend, take one of those lemons or limes, slice it up as you would have it in your gin and tonic, lay it out on a lime tray and pop it into the freezer. It can just be whatever flat surface in the freezer. And once it's frozen solid, you can store those in a freezer bag. And when you have your nice, cold, crisp gin and tonic, you can add a frozen slice of lemon or lime or whatever fruit, to be honest. Yeah. Probably not banana, but, you know, <laughs> your berries and all of that. And just use them as ice cubes. This is dangerous because actually the idea of having frozen lemon slices on hand for a gin and tonic. Yeah, and it makes a beautiful sound. That fizz when you yes. drop it in, it's very nice for a Friday afternoon, you know, as the sun's coming out in the summer. I mean, this just shows, right, so... I would say lemons would be the kind of thing that I would be really worried about freezing. I think they'd end up as mush. I wouldn't know what to do with them when they're coming out. I think that's probably the same that a lot of people feel about a lot of foods in their freezer. What are people doing wrong? A lot of the time, it's about how people are freezing things and the assumption that they have to defrost everything. Right. So when we freeze things, any water that is in the cells of the food is going to expand and break the walls of the cells. So if you defrost it, you're going to end up with a pool of mush. It's not going to be very nice. Mm -hmm. And if you freeze it in a too big a quantity, so for example, like putting that whole lemon or that whole lime into the freezer or other things like if you froze, I don't know, like mushrooms whole without slicing them first mm. and then you let them defrost, they are going to lose, you know, the firmness that they've got because all of the water's coming out of the cells. If you cook with them straight from frozen and if you've frozen them already sliced or already however you want to use them and you cook them straight from frozen over a nice high heat, evaporate off the water quickly, you can retain some of that structure in the food. Right. So it's, it's very much about thinking before you put stuff into the freezer and then when I want to defrost it I usually would freeze that flat and, and have it in a freezer bag so it doesn't take up much space I can then just pop it in a dish of cold water and the water conducts um, heat much more effectively than air so it will draw the ice out of the food much faster and then you can get to cooking much quicker so anybody who is not good at getting the food out of the freezer the night before like I'm your girl. I, I cannot do yeah. that. It's an hour before we eat that I go, mm, what, do you, what do you fancy? And all the food will come straight from the freezer and either be defrosted quickly or cooked from frozen. Is there a hard and fast rule over what needs to be defrosted before you cook and what you can just chuck straight into the pan? I would say, I mean, most stuff can be cooked straight from frozen. The one thing that I tend to strongly recommend defrosting is meat and particularly, you know, I mean, if it's joints of meat, unless you have a pressure cooker, you're going to need to defrost it because otherwise it's going to be overcooked on the outside and it's going to be frozen in the middle still. And it's just, you're either going to make yourself very sick or it's going to be inedible, basically. If you've got something like meatballs, you know, because they're smaller, because they're not going to tend to overcook in the same way that you would something like chicken, you can get away with cooking that from frozen. But really, I, I strongly recommend using a heat probe thermometer to check if you have cooked something from frozen. Even if you're reheating something that was previously cooked, using a thermometer will give you so much more confidence that, you know, you've got it up to a safe temperature. But yeah, most of all vegetables I would cook straight from frozen, whether they were shop bought or whether I'd frozen them myself. Um, it's just such a good time saver. And I'd ask you the list of the heat safe temperatures, but actually better off people just go to witch.co.uk and Absolutely. your own website, it will all be listed there. Completely, completely. So a lot of this sounds like you're kind of time shifting the prep of meals to before the freezing, a lot of it, rather than going, this is the raw material, I'm just chucking it in and I'll do everything afterwards. Yeah. When do you kind of prep stuff for freezers? So this is something that shifts and changes dependent on how my life is looking. So sometimes there'll be things that I purposefully buy mm. and I'll get extra of because, you know, I know I always have peppers in the freezer. I always want to cut my own because the shop bought ones are far too small. So I would always buy extra. And whilst I've got dinner on... I would cut up the extra peppers and get them into the freezer. There are other times where it's literally like this morning, for example, my kids wanted apple in their porridge. I only used, I don't know, about half, two thirds of the apple. So I grated it into their porridge, but then I grated the rest of the apple. They're just eating breakfast. I'm just getting ready, but it's 
30 seconds that I've just whacked that into the freezer. So whilst you could spend time purposefully going, okay, on a Saturday morning, I'm going to get up, I've got Mm. these things that I want to freeze. I really advocate for, ah, I've got a minute here, I've got a minute there. And it it largely centres around what have I got in the fridge that is not going to make it. So if I've got, you know, some carrots that I know we're not going to get through, if I've got potatoes in the cupboard that we're not going to get through, it's looking at them and going, right, I'm going to press pause on it now because I know I'm not going to use that food. I know I'm not going to get through that hummus. So I'm going to freeze the half a tub when I open it so that I can use that later for something else. And it's just that shift of, you know, if I know it's going to go in the bin, then I'll take the three minutes that it might take to chop something up, you know, chop up some onions, whatever, and just get it in the freezer, really. Getting into the habit. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, and it is it is a shift of habit. Like, I think when you've been, you know, I'd been cooking for, I don't know, 20, 15, 20 years before I started doing this. And it was a shift of habit for me, even. I used to batch cook. So that was like my go-to thing. So it does take time to stop and think. And you have to have the freezer organised in a way that lets you find things as well. But once you get into that habit, it's quite addictive, to be honest. Yeah, well, I've seen <laughs> pictures of your freezer. And it is an incredible organisation, a lot of freezer bags, a lot of labelling. It looks more like a filing cabinet than most people's freezers. How do you do that and how can people do that at home? First of all, I can assure you the rest of my house is not that (laughs) (laughs) organised. The rest of it is devastation, but the freezer is very calming for me. So yes, as as you describe it, so I store things in freezer bags, which I hasten to add, I wash and reuse. So I do not throw them away with every use and everything is labelled across the top so the ones I use have a coloured strip across the top and you can write on it with a marker and then you can wash it and and rub it off and relabel it which I find massively massively helpful Are they the Ikea ones? They are, I love those freezer bags Yes, the Istad bags so I was very lucky The house we moved into came with an integrated freezer, which is full height. So I do have, I think I've got eight drawers maybe, but some are very shallow. But they are labelled. So I have my baked goods. I have things that came for like pantry items. So like half leftover tins of things like kidney beans and chickpeas and tomato puree, things like that. And then fruits and uh, vegetables and leftovers like leftover meal items. So I'll fly flat freeze, things like if I've made more chilli than we need, we'll have the leftover meals, but also leftover meats, so cooked chicken or cooked bacon or whatever it might be, and the raw fish and the raw meat are at the bottom to avoid cross-contamination with anything else in the freezer. But the, the reason that I have sort of these categories there is one, so I can find things Mm. really quickly. Two, so my husband can find things. I'm sure we had this. It was around here. It's in the drawer that is labelled. You don't have a husband drawer yet? No, no. no. I mean, every so often he buys something really wild card and I'm like, there's not a drawer for that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's fine. We'll we'll get that. It's all right. But yeah, it, it just makes it so much easier. And for me, having things in the freezer bags makes it quite aesthetically pleasing as well. So it's quite a calming, nice space to go into. Like, don't get me wrong, sometimes it gets a bit haphazard if there's a food, you know, you get the shopping delivery and somebody just chucks stuff in. There has to be a reshuffle every so often. But it's very quick to do now that things have a place. And on top of being able to find the things quickly, it also means that we're not using as much energy in terms of standing there with the door open for ages. It's obviously keeping the food colder, which is keeping it safer if we're, you know, although I do go in and out of the freezer a lot. So, you know, it's it's a half a dozen one, <laughs> you know, but it, it, it's something that allows me to introduce more variety to our food by having the categories. It just keeps control of it. It just means that I can have 15, 20, 30 different types of veg, for example, across one or two drawers and just have a handful of this, a handful of that. Mm. And so, you know, my objective to try and have variety in our cooking and cook relatively healthily and from scratch is really enabled by it being a space that is organised, that's accessible. And it's really satisfying when you make a meal and you go, all of that stuff would have gone in the bin before. And I guess on that note about health, I think there's a misconception, or at least there was, that 
because something's frozen, it's not fresh and it's not as healthy. But actually, it can be better, can't it? Can have more sort of nutrients locked inside it than just leaving something in your fridge for a while. Completely, completely. And I mean, I'm I'm a massive advocate for, although I, I don't buy a lot of shop-bought frozen food purely because of the variety, and obviously I'm, I'm here to help people reduce their food waste by freezing, so I don't buy a lot myself. But I'm absolutely an advocate for buying frozen produce from your supermarket because if you are very busy and you want to eat well, you've got so many different fruits and vegetables that are pre-prepared. You know, they're Mm. there, ready to cook with chopped onions, chopped peppers, sweet potato, berries. There are so many different frozen fruits and vegetables now that are available in the shops. And as you say, when you freeze things, you lock in the nutritional value. I think a concern like a lot of people might have about stuff in their freezer, if they're especially if they're not doing it properly, is that it will end up tasting like freezer or it will end up tasting like cardboard. How do you stop that and, and what is actually going on there? Yeah, so usually if food has started to take on the taste or smell of freezer, it is either it's not been packaged particularly well, so maybe it's been put in a sandwich bag rather than a freezer bag, or you've not sealed the bag. So if it's Mm. a shop-bought item, you might have opened it up and just kind of scrunched up the bag and hoped that none of the stuff falls out of it. Um, So making sure that you squeeze air out of whatever bags or containers you're using and that they are actually suitable for the freezer, like a lot of people use takeaway tubs, Mm. and that plastic is usually not actually supposed to go in the freezer. Oh, really? It it becomes very brittle. So it's just looking at what you're actually using to store the food in. And then in terms of timings, technically, if your freezer is like minus 18 degrees C, which is the recommended temperature, it should last, I mean, essentially indefinitely, although I'm I'm not saying you should do that. (laughs) Um, It's not a safety issue because bacteria can't multiply at that temperature, Mm. but it is a quality issue. So the longer that food is in your freezer for, the more the quality is going to deteriorate. And what's happening, particularly you see it with things like meat, where you get freezer burn, so it looks all mottled and not very pleasant. It's basically dehydration. So it's the moisture in the food coming and kind of migrating out of the food and into the freezer. And, you know, we see it a lot with frozen veg as well, where you you end up with your veg frozen into an ice block. Mm -hmm. Um, It's perfectly safe to eat. Right. It's fine. It's just the moisture from the food coming out. So the quality is going to be deteriorating. And in those instances, my advice is always, you know, as long as it otherwise is okay, as long as it's not that the freezer's defrosted and you've just turned it back on and refrozen everything or or something like that, just use that food in something where you wouldn't notice it as much. So if it's veggies, you could make a soup, you could make a stew, you could chuck it in a curry. And the same for meats, you know, using meat that's been freezer burnt. If you want to, you can cut off any affected parts. But as I say, you know, it, it's just going to be a bit tougher. Like, mm. I think it it depends very much on how sensitive you are in terms of your meals. You know, if you're, if you're really, really into your food and you can't stand it, you know, then you might want to cut those bits off. But most of the time, you wouldn't really be able to mm. tell. You won't really be able to notice if it's in a dish with a nice heavy sauce and, and plenty of flavour. But yeah, my general advice would be three to six months for most stuff. If you've got something that is very small or very thin, so to give you a comparison, actually, so if you've got, um, say, some sliced ham, you could freeze the slices of ham, you can package those so they've sort of got some baking parchment between Mm. or as individual slices or tear it up and open freeze it. Uh, So you've got little bits to chuck in pasta or omelettes or pizza, but they are not going to last very long because it's so thin Mm. and so delicate, you know, within a couple of weeks that is going to be really badly affected by freezer burn, even if you wrap it really well, even if you vacuum packed it, Mm. it is going to start to be affected. If you had something like um, a ham joint, which is vacuum packed and it is very substantial, and particularly if it's vacuum packed, there's nowhere for the moisture to go. So it's contained within. Mm. That could be fine for a year, for two years. It's all about kind of how delicate the food is and, and how much moisture there is in it to escape and how easily that can happen. So um, just, you know, look at the food and and weigh up what you're freezing and don't throw things away just for the sake of it, really. (laughs) That is my motto as well. What other gadgets and, and bits are there to buy? And do you need to buy much stuff to get into this? Not 
really. I mean, there there are some things that are really necessary, I think. So like thermometers, so a fridge and freezer thermometer with a remote display is very helpful. Like I said before, your freezer should be minus 18 degrees C. So if you've got a sensor you can put into the freezer and you can keep an eye on it, you know your food's safe and you know it's at a good temperature. When you're actually cooking, a food probe thermometer is really, really helpful and really reassuring to make sure your food is getting up to a nice safe temperature. And then the other things really, you know, I said about like open freezing things, so like the lemons and limes, that is literally just having a flat surface with some baking parchment on it. When I first started, I would use baking trays, picnic plates, plastic storage lids. Now I have stackable freezer trays and I have reusable baking parchment and they do make a difference for me because I'm constantly, you know, freezing the next thing and and not just doing it for myself, I'm doing it for content as well. But it, it gives you something that is very structured and you're not going to end up with all the food sliding off it and ending up in your freezer. Because open freezing is just freezing things individually sort of on a tray, as you say, so that they don't kind of clump together into one lump. Yeah, exactly that. So it's literally, as you say, just letting it freeze so that you've not got this sort of food bug that you're going to have to defrost or whack on the counter. Grace, wouldn't it be good if there was somewhere that people could find out where some of the best meat probe thermometers are? If only there was a website. Oh, and a subscription service, witch.co.uk. We have actually very recently done a test of thermometers, really interesting results and actually some really cheap options out there. So um, everybody go check that out. On that note, we're going to go to a quick break now. But when we come back, we're going to be looking at some new witch research about where the greenest chain restaurants are for when you're eating out, not just when you're eating at home. So join us after the break. Like listening to podcasts just like this one from the team at Witch? Well, we've got some good news. All our podcasts are now available to listen to on YouTube and YouTube Music. So whether you like listening to Get Answers, Witch Shorts or Witch Money, all episodes can now be listened to directly on YouTube or through the YouTube Music app. To find them, just search for the podcast you'd like to listen to. YouTube's additional functionality also means that you can now read along with subtitles as you listen. Don't panic though, all which podcasts are still available to listen to elsewhere too. So wherever you listen, we'll see you soon. Welcome back. Before we get into it, I'm going to ask you a quick favour. If you're liking what you're hearing, please take a minute, leave us a rating and a review because it will help push our podcast up in the algorithm and ultimately it gets heard by more people. Anyway, I'm pleased to say we're joined right now by witch nutritionist Shafali Loth, who has some great new research to share with us today. Hi. What is the research? So for the first time ever, we've surveyed high street restaurant chains to see whether some are more eco-friendly than others. We looked at a total of 28 chains that you'd see on your high street, those most frequented and also really popular with which members. And we sent out a huge survey asking them about their energy use, their water use, um, their sourcing policies for certain foods, their waste and food waste and their plastic use, and also about the information that they supply to their customers and their targets for future reduction. And actually, we then got all that information back and crunched it into a huge spreadsheet and got results. And actually, there is a big difference between the restaurants that you would frequent on the high street. What were the results then? What did you find? Okay, so actually, the top We call them eco-providers at which the restaurant that topped our table was Oaxaca, a Mexican themed restaurant that's mainly in the southeast London area, but also has outposts in Cardiff, Edinburgh and Brighton. And actually, it did really well in our survey and it has some really, really great policies. So, for example, it serves free range chicken, which actually for a chain restaurant is quite rare. It also serves free range pork and all their eggs are free range. All its fish is MSE certified. So all these things mean that it's, 
you know, they're sourcing policies. They take a real pride and interest in where they're sourcing their food from. The really interesting thing about them as well is that on their menus, they signpost carbon emissions for their meals. So as a customer going in, you can look at the carbon emissions for that meal and their signpost is as high, medium or low. Very good. And who else is at the top there? Okay, so second in our survey was Nando's. And actually, that might be quite surprising to people. But again, they have a really interesting business model. And I suppose it's quite a streamlined menu that they offer. So actually, they yeah, chicken (laughs) and some sides. But actually, that means they can be really conscious about their sourcing policies for the ingredients that they have. So actually, for a business its size, it has low energy and water use. It also has really good policies regarding waste. So none of its waste or food waste goes to landfill. The business also has really great policies for sourcing sustainable palm oil. Obviously, it uses a lot of soya beans in the feed for its chickens, so it sources those responsibly as well. And also, all of its staff receive sustainability training. And can you explain a bit more about the different levels of sourcing? Because I suppose you can ask a restaurant where it gets its ingredients, Mm. But then there are there are issues with the supply chain, which we may not be privy to, that it's harder to understand. Is that right? Yeah. And of course, actually, a lot of these restaurants have huge supply chains and they're sourcing their ingredients from a lot of different places. So what we looked at was, OK, four ingredients that we know can be slightly problematic from an environmental perspective or a welfare perspective. So let's take fish, for example. So if a menu or a restaurant has fish on its menu, then we would say, okay, well, what are your policies to ensure that you're sourcing that correctly? So is it MSE certified? If it's farmed fish, you know, is that aquaculture stewardship certified or is it RSPCA certified? So there are different certification schemes and we use those as a sign for awarding scores, for example. And there's a scale, obviously. If someone served organic produce, then that was the gold standard. So actually, a lot of chains do serve organic milk, for example. So Pret, all of the milk that they serve is organic, which is great with things like palm oil, soya, tea, coffee. We know that there are issues with either deforestation or maybe labour. So we ensure, well, we awarded scores if someone told us that they were sourcing fair trade or Rainforest Alliance approved products. Okay. I mean, it's interesting the trend for a lot of restaurants to boast about not using frozen food. That must kind of grate a little bit. (laughs) Uh, It does. And I think especially if they've got a lot of waste, then actually if they're using, you know, really you want some restaurants that are proud of the fact that they're using frozen produce to ensure that they're minimising their waste, that they've got flexibility around the dishes they can serve because they've got that variety there. So, yeah, I think the more that we can, you know, champion the fact that actually there is no shame in frozen, frozen is is fantastic. I, I, I wasn't aware of that, but actually I find that really incredible especially if you're thinking about fruit and veg, whereas actually frozen can often have higher levels of nutrients in it than fresh. So there's no shame in using frozen produce. Well, if we're talking about shame, who was at the bottom of our rankings? Okay, so I'm going to say no shame because actually... Out of the 28 restaurants we approach, most were really good and did engage with us and fill out our surveys. And there was a handful of restaurants that didn't engage with us. And those were Five Guys, Hungry Horse, Pizza Express, Subway, TGI Fridays and Yo Sushi. So actually they either didn't respond or they said they weren't going to fill out the survey. And actually there I think there's some shame Mm. because... Consumers want to know these things. You know, we've surveyed people. They told us they want restaurants to behave more responsibly in terms of environmental impact. So by them not sharing their information, they're really withholding that from Mm. their customers. At the bottom of our table were KFC and Greg's. But actually, the reason they came bottom was not because they're particularly bad. It's because they didn't or weren't able to share key data with us. And that, for example, might be on food waste or energy usage or water usage. So we obviously couldn't give them marks for things that we didn't know. But actually, 
I wouldn't say that they were a bottom and I wouldn't say there should be shame. And how important do you think it is in the great scheme of, you know, our own food waste at home, but also generally everyone trying to be a sustainable consumer? How big of an impact do you think restaurants have? They have a huge impact. Um, You know, if you think about their food chains, where they're sourcing their food from, the production of that food, then them transporting it, um, them running their restaurants. For example, with fast food chains or what we traditionally think of as fast food, quick service restaurants, 99% of their emissions come from their food chain. So that's a huge amount. So actually, if you think about the businesses in our survey, they contribute thousands, millions of tonnes of carbon emissions to the environment every year. So they do have a responsibility. And as a consumer, there's only, you know, there are things you can do when you're eating out as well. You can choose where you're eating, you can choose what you're ordering, but also you can make sure you don't overorder. And if you do overorder, then take that food home in a doggy bag so it's not going to waste. And Kate, if you take food home in the doggy bag, you overorder on a Chinese, what is the status of that food? Is it freezeable? (sighs) This is one of the ones that breaks my heart a little because the answer is sometimes. So if you've gone somewhere and you know that the food has been cooked fresh and it's not been reheated, then yeah, you could probably freeze it and reheat it. I've done it with pizza. I've actually done it with fish and chips as well from my local fish and chip shop. I know they cook it all fresh. But if you have something like a Chinese takeaway, where especially if it's a dish that actually requires reheating. So if you've got egg fried rice, that rice is going to have been cooked and then it's going to have been reheated to make the egg fried rice and we shouldn't really be reheating food more than once, especially the fact that you don't know the circumstances Mm. in the kitchen of where it's been prepared. So from a food safety perspective, I would always say exercise some caution, think about has this food likely been reheated already? If so, as you said, try not to overorder. Sometimes a bit of food waste can't be helped. But if we can freeze it, then definitely go for it and just reheat it thoroughly afterwards. I think there's something to be said for cold leftovers, though. I, I think love so. cold yeah, leftovers. Yeah. Yeah. All the way. Sounds yeah. like you're telling us to eat Fully. pizza for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Do that. <laughs> Well, on a slightly classier note than uh, pizza for breakfast, I've actually been having a chat with Mark Selby. He's the co-founder of Oaxaca to find out what they've been doing that's earned them that coveted which eco provider label. So Mark Selby, co-founder of Oaxaca, it's so good to have you here. Firstly, why is sustainability important to you? We set up the business back in 2007 and very much from the off, we determined we want to prove that you could build and scale a truly sustainable restaurant business. So from the beginning, we always challenged ourselves every year to be as sustainable as we can. And and what does that actually look like then in your restaurants? It starts from the way we build our restaurants. So we now build our restaurants to a what's called a SCAR level gold, which is an external independent assessment of the way we build our restaurants. And we always get the top rating and that's always our kind of benchmark and that means things like not putting water boilers in it means using heat both coming off the extract from the grills and also heat being produced by condensers in fridges that goes to heat water that then goes into the loos and the taps rather than having these water boilers constantly on it's the paint even when we get graffiti artists we insist they use environmentally friendly paints through to furniture sourcing all of these things in terms of the build and then we've got the actual menu itself so We very much do two things. One is we look at our sourcing. So we work with sort of local suppliers like Hodmadods, Riverford Organic. All of our chicken is free range. Our pork is free range. Our beef is outdoor reared. So we're very careful and selective in terms of how we source things. And then linked to that as well, we've actually shifted our menu over the years because obviously the biggest component parts of carbon emissions are beef and meat in general, I should say, beef being the worst, but meat and dairy. So we not in an aggressive way, but just in an informative way, we've slowly shifted our menu to be roughly 50, well, a bit more 50% vegetarian. And what we're very keen to do is we're, we're not there to dictate or preach to our customers. So we don't say that you must do this or that. We basically seek to inform and we offer everything. But by doing that, we have delicious veg dishes and we also have delicious meat dishes. And, and slowly 
what we've seen is people evolve and try different things. And then we had a head of sustainability. We sit down every month and we really challenge ourselves to say, what is there out there more that we could be doing? How can we go about it? Who do we need to work with? And that's a really exciting bit of the business as well. And how much extra resource does it take for you to be sustainable? Is there a cost attached to all of this? There is a cost. Yeah. I mean, from having someone as our head of sustainability, for example, to I think we're just opening a site in Paddington in mid-April. I think probably the extra cost of fitting that out is probably fifty to a hundred thousand pounds, somewhere around that, depending on where you move things around. But for us, and part of our DNA is very much driven by that. So it's something that we factor into the overall business model. And how much do you think the owner should be on the consumer to make more environmentally friendly choices when they're in a restaurant? I think it has to be on the consumer or the government. I, I don't believe in being a business, as I said earlier, that, that preaches to people. I don't think anyone wants to go in somewhere and be preached to. So what we try to do is put all the information out there, try and educate give detail. If someone wants to come in and have a, uh, a heavy meat sort of special occasion, then we're not going to stop them. We're going to celebrate that with them as well. I think the consumer are slowly becoming more aware of things. I think ultimately government are going to have to get involved if we're going to properly really influence people because everyone slips back into habits, thinks oh, it doesn't matter anymore. I'm just interested that you are zero landfill. So where does your food waste go and how do you manage that? Our food waste, again, is something we've always been very focused on. So less than 1% of our, of our total food is wasted. And the vast majority of that 1% is actually things like avocado skins, avocado stones, things that you literally can't do anything with. All of that, 99% of that in our restaurants, so and 99% of the 1% is put into food recycling and then goes in to be anaerobically digested. So it becomes compost effectively. So we have a very kind of clean system on that. And, in, and with regards to the restaurant, everyone is very focused on not having waste. Things like doggy bags, but pretty much, not, yeah, as I said, 99% will go into a sort of a compostable bin, which will be taken off by our suppliers and turned into compost. So yeah, and with our head chefs, we, we bonus and incentivize them on their food waste to be below that 1% threshold. It is a sort of very important thing for us in the business. Well, Mark, it was great to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Really enjoyed it. A lot of talk about responsibility there, us as consumers, restaurants, what they can do, government as well. But I think supermarkets have a bit of a role in this. I love that some providers of mint, for example, they package it in a container, which for me, as a bit of a lazy person, very easy to chuck that into the freezer rather than a plastic tub. Is there anything that you think supermarkets could probably do, manufacturers could do to make it easier for people to waste less food? Yeah, I mean, definitely providing better advice on freezing on the packaging. I mean, I might do myself out of a job here, but often you'll get foods that will say they're not suitable for freezing. And often it's a quality issue, not a safety issue. Oh. Mm. So it might be that it can't be frozen and defrosted and eaten as you would use it. It, but for example, yogurt, but you could freeze it in cubes and chuck it in a smoothie. So you you change the way that you use the foods. And I, I understand that can be difficult for supermarkets and food manufacturers. But we are seeing brands of supermarkets that are putting labels highlighting this food can be frozen. I've seen it in M&S. You know, so the more that supermarkets can communicate about freezing and about the difference between use buys and best befores, we've obviously seen mm -hmm. a lot of best befores being removed. We've seen some use buys changing to best befores on products like yogurts. So I think the more that, you know, we can be supported in making the food last as long as possible at home is really, really valuable. Um, and, you know, considering that with people who live on their own as well. So giving that flexibility about being able to choose loose and, you know, not have to buy massive bulk. Or if you are buying bulk, then obviously learn how to freeze it. Well, on that note, that is all we've got time for this week. Thank you so much, both of you, for coming in. It has been fantastic. Obviously, there are a million and one different things to freeze. You've got all the information on how to do that, Kate, on your channels. Where can we find you? At The Full Freezer on pretty much any social media, but Instagram is my main home, really. And you've got a book coming out, is that right? When's that going to be out? I do. Uh, it's the 14th of March. Pre-orders are available. They are, absolutely. Shafali, Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. 
Next episode, we're going to be heading into the great outdoors. Where are the best places to buy your camping kit? And how can you avoid being left with all the gear but no idea? Grace, what's happening on the Money Pod this week? Well, it's the hottest day in the Money Pod calendar this week. It is, of course, the spring budget. We'll be reacting and analysing everything you need to know about the contents of Jeremy Hunt's Red Box. Do hit subscribe if you're not already so that you'll be notified as soon as it's released. And as usual, if you'd like to get in touch with us before then, we're at Witch UK on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and X, or you can drop us an email at podcast at witch.co.uk. And like Harry mentioned earlier, if you are able to leave us a rating and a review, it will really help us grow and we'll be forever grateful. Today's Get Answers was presented by me, Harry Kind, alongside Grace Farrell, produced by Rob Lilly-Jones and recorded by Adrian Bradley and edited by Eric Breer. And thanks again to our wonderful guests, Kate Hall, Shafali Loth and Mark Selby. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Want to stay ahead of fraudsters and across the latest scams? At which we helped prevent an estimated £1.8 million in scam losses last year thanks to our Scam Alert newsletter. And each week we provide more information on the latest scam activity, helping protect you, your family and your friends. Stay in the know and avoid falling victim to scammers by joining over 450,000 people already signed up to our free Witch Scam Alerts. To join them, head to witch.co.uk slash scam alert and sign up today.